Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Pastor Tyrone P. Jones IV, and I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church of Guilford, House of Faith, where we believe in preaching, teaching, reaching, and healing. Our director of music has come up with a song that says, we are gathered to worship him, to lift up our voices in praise. We're glad you have joined us in celebration to God Almighty, wonderful Savior, Lord of Lord, to him who is the King of Kings. We welcome you to First Baptist Church. Thank you for coming today. God be praised. This service is a service designed so that we can worship the Lord to get the word and go out to serve. Thank you for joining us today. Come on back and see us anytime. But right now, let's get ready to go into worship. some praise all over the building if you know the blood still works somebody ought to tell God thank you for the blood hallelujah 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 we certainly thank and praise God for the movement of the Holy Spirit in this place amen there is a word from the Lord and that word is found in the gospel of Luke Luke's gospel chapter 7 still in the midst of our series, A Genuine Encounter with Jesus, Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. I want to begin reading at verse 1 and end reading at verse number 10. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Here begins the reading of God's Word. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. And there a centurion ser servant whom the master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me, I tell this one go and he goes. I tell that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may have your seats. As you assume a posture of prayers for the next few moments that are mine to share, I want to talk about a genuine encounter with Jesus, an unexpected interruption. Tell somebody an unexpected interruption. Uh, tell another neighbor, an unexpected interruption. One more for the Holy Ghost, an unexpected interruption. There we go, amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come now in this moment of preaching. Thank you, Lord God, for how you blessed us in the early service. I pray, God, for a double portion of your anointing in this worship experience. Thank you, Lord God, for all that has transpired. And I pray, Lord God, that somebody's life would be transformed by your word. Now, God, endow me with all that I might need to preach with power and clarity in this place. God, we love you and we thank you in advance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
an unexpected interruption. Beloved, on last Sunday, we told you that it is important for everyone to strive to have a genuine encounter with Jesus. A lot of people are looking for things to entice them and to excite them. But the reality is, beloved, it is only a, a genuine encounter with Christ that's really going to be long-lasting. Uh, some of the things that are superficial with our connection with God uh, is temporary at best. But how many know I need God in my Mondays? I need God in my Tuesdays. I need to have a connection with God Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then all over again on Sunday. I need a genuine encounter with the Lord. And so it's important, beloved, that if you're seeking a genuine encounter with God, that you do what is necessary in order to come close to God, to get connected with Jesus, especially in this day and age that we're living in where everything and everyone is all about temporary moments in life. But I don't want to be temporarily connected to Christ. I want to remain firmly connected with Jesus. And the only way to do that, beloved, is to have a genuine encounter with the Lord. Now, beloved, in order to have a genuine encounter, that requires genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And genuine faith means to have total belief and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to have total belief and total trust in Christ. And I know some people say, I know who Jesus is. I believe that Jesus is real, all based upon my belief and my faith. But your faith ought to grow to another level where the word of God takes you to a place where you can not only believe that he is, but trust that God will do for you. Is there anybody that's in there early in the sermon that can testify that I not only believe in the Lord, but I trust in the Lord? Old folks used to sing a song, I will trust in the Lord till I die, till I die. I'm going to stay on the battlefield till I die. You've got to not only believe in Jesus, but you must trust in the Lord. Because belief and trust go hand in hand. Because it's one thing to believe, but it's something else totally different to put your wholehearted trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, there's an example in the scriptures where we see the disciples that are following Jesus uh, demonstrating their faith in the Lord. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And this is the instance when Jesus walks on the water. He's dismissed the crowd after feeding the 5,000. He then puts the disciples in the boat to go on to the other side. And as they're making their way to the other side, the Bible declares that there's a tempest, a storm that rises up on the sea. And about the third watch of the night, around three or four o'clock in the morning, it is there that Jesus walks on the water. Now, these disciples are toiling against the wind and the waves, but they see what appears to be an image of Jesus walking on the water. Now, most of the disciples in the boat did not trust the image that they saw. They thought it was a ghost, but Jesus says in the scriptures, don't be afraid. It is I. You can trust in the fact that I'm right here with you in the middle of the storm. And isn't that good news to know that the Lord will ride in the storm with you? That you don't have to worry about Jesus being distant from you, but the Lord is right there? And Peter, big mouth Peter, began to say, well, Lord, if it's you, bid me come on the water. And the Lord said, come. And right around about verse 29, it's there that Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. He comes to him. He gets out of the boat, the only one of all the disciples, and he's walking on the water. And as he's walking on the water, he's walking by faith. He's believing God in the middle of the storm. He's trusting the voice that he heard briefly in that moment. But you know what happened, beloved? He started looking at the wind and started seeing the waves. How many of us get caught up like that? 
we get the belief in God, Lord, thank you, and we step out of the boat. But as we're walking, that's when the winds and the waves start rising up. And then all of a sudden, we're like, wait a minute, I can't be doing this. This is an impossibility. And the Bible says he started to sink and he cries out, Lord, save me. And it is there, beloved, right around verse number 31. The Bible says that when in Matthew 14 that he saw the wind and became afraid and began to sink and he cried out unto God. And verse 31 says, immediately the Lord reached out his hand and caught him. And watch it. He said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You of little faith. When Jesus says little faith, it's not a matter of the size of Peter's faith that was important, but it was the matter of the level of trust that Peter had in God. The trust factor needed to be there. That's why he said he had little faith. And is that you today? Somebody has declared, I have faith in God. I believe in God. I believe that Jesus is real. But how far can your faith carry you? How far can your faith take you when you're going through the storms of life, when you're riding through the storm? Will you trust God even when the winds are blowing and when the waves are crashing? Will you put your wholehearted trust in God to know that the same God that gave voice to you to say, come meet me in the storm is the same God that will walk back with you all the way to the boat? Anybody trusting God today? And so with little faith is what he declared unto Peter. Now remember, Peter was the only one who got out of the boat. Everybody else was watching, and, and they were not even moved by the fact that the Lord said, come, or that the Lord said that it is I. So Peter is the man of little faith. If Peter is the man of little faith, what is it for the rest of the disciples? If Peter is the one that has little faith and the Lord commends him for the little bit of faith that he had as he walks out on the water, what's, what do we declare about the other disciples cowering in the boat as the storm is raging? Maybe they had what I call minuscule faith. Or maybe they had what I call fractured faith. You know what fractured faith is. That's faith that only cherry picks parts of the word of God in order for you to fully believe in that I'm not going to believe this about God, but I'm going to find what I want to believe and pick that fractured faith. Maybe somebody today has fractured faith, and that's worse than little faith, amen. At least Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, and when he fell and started going down, he had Jesus right there to pick him up. But fractured faith distances you even further from God and does not draw you any closer. But, beloved, it is important to understand that the Lord wants us to not only have belief, but full trust in him. And so it's necessary, beloved, to have great faith, genuine faith, because genuine faith will lead us to a genuine encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again. Genuine faith, faith that believes and trusts, will give you a genuine encounter with with the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we see in Matthew's gospel the example of what little faith is and what little faith looks like. Well, Pastor Jones, what does great faith look like? Well, in our text, we witness an unexpected interruption in the model of what great faith and a great encounter with Jesus truly looks like. Jesus encounters a man that he labels as an individual that has great faith. But he's not the traditional representation of what a follower of Jesus would even look like. And how many know, beloved, that sometimes God pauses our steps and allows us to see in the midst unexpected interruptions that allow us to know that what you think may not totally be what is, but the reality is God can work through who God wants to, when God wants to, how God wants to. And so we've got to stop looking at people and listing people with labels and start looking at people and seeing the God that lives on the inside of them. And it does not matter about race or ethnicity. We are all children of the Most High God. 
And anybody glad about that? That when I look at you and you look at me, you should only see a child of God. This man does not look like the traditional representation of what it means to be a disciple and a traditional representation of even what it looks like to be a Christian. I don't even know if this centurion is a Christian. All we know is that he is a man that Jesus calls a man of great faith. And so Jesus now has just finished giving specific instructions to all of his disciples on how to be effective disciples. In fact, when you get home, look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. It is there that we see where Jesus taught them how it is necessary to love your enemies, to do good to those that hate you, and to bless those who curse you, and to pray for those who mistreat you. It got quiet. Amen. This is a laundry list, amen, of what Jesus says is required for you to be a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, the Bible says he calls the disciples unto himself. And he says, these are the things that you must do if you're truly going to be my disciples. And things you've got to do is right here, verse 27 and 28. He says, you've got to do good to those that hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. I'm going to say it again for the people in the back. Amen. He says, you got to do good to those that hate you. You got to love your enemies. You got to bless those who curse you. And you got to pray for those who mistreat you. How many of us are really lining up to live out what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Don't you clap if you don't mean it. Amen. One of the hardest things it is to do is to love your enemies. Let alone bless those who mistreat you and let alone be kind to those who curse you. Because the reality is you don't want to love on them. You want to do something else to them. <laughs> you don't want to love your enemies. You want to cut your enemies. Amen. <laughs> you, 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 you don't want to help uh, 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 those that mistreat you. Uh, you, want to, you don't want to be kind to them. Amen. And bless them. No. You want to curse those who curse you. Ain't that in the Bible, Pastor Jones? No, that's not in there. I'm looking right now. It's not in there. He says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Can you pray for those who mistreat you? Mm -hmm, two people, amen. Two people. I see y'all over there, amen, amen. God bless your hearts, amen. It's not easy, but this is the design that the Lord has set up for the disciples to follow. When you come down a little further in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, it tells us about in verse 37, don't judge lest you be judged. Don't content, condemn and you will not be condemned. And then forgive and you'll be forgiven. Do y'all see that? It's in my Bible. I hope it's in yours. He says here, don't judge nobody lest you be judged. So it's, while you're pointing the finger at somebody else, amen, you need to start looking at your own self. While you're trying to pull the log out of somebody else's eye, you need to look at the sawdust and specks in your own eye. My daddy, it's his birthday today, amen. God rest his soul. I miss that man. But my dad would always say, listen, uh, stir your own pitcher of Kool-Aid and leave my cup of Kool-Aid alone. The reality is you got your pitcher, I got mine. Whatever my flavor is, is my flavor. You need to leave my pitcher alone. You need to look at your own life. And you need to make sure that you're not judging others lest you be judged. Make sure you don't condemn or you will be condemned. But if you don't want to be condemned, don't condemn anybody else. Then it says forgive and you'll be forgiven. Now, that's one of the hardest ones of all because how many know when someone has injured you and someone has done something against you and when someone has harmed you, it's hard to forgive. But what the Lord is saying here, as I have forgiven you, when you were a wretch undone and an enemy of God and have now come into the place where you're my sons and daughters, now you must release that hurt and pain from yourself so that you can live a life free in Jesus Christ. Because how many know the only person you're hurting when you hold on to unforgiveness is yourself? 
The only person that you're causing pain and all kind of angina and anxiety and heart palpitations and all kind of troubles, back troubles, spasms, thinking about what somebody did just because Joe owe you $20 from 20 years ago and you holding that against Joe because you just saw Joe drive off in a brand new car and they ain't pay you back your $20. How many know the Lord has blessed you multiple times over since Joe hadn't paid you your $20? But you holding on to old grudges and old stuff from the past when the Lord says, let that stuff go and live free in Jesus Christ. I just said something there. The Lord wants us to be able to forgive so that we can be free in Jesus. But then I love it, Reverend Jay. It says right here in Luke 7, 38, to give and it shall be given you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall I give unto men and women's bosoms. This is not just talking about the necessity of money matters, but this is talking about how we treat other people. God is looking at how we treat other people. And a part of the design of discipleship is making sure that we treat other people right, even when they don't treat us right and that we do good to those that don't necessarily do good to us. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but the Lord says, if you follow this formula of discipleship, then when you give, I'll give it back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And, and, and listen, nobody can pay you back like Jesus. You looking for Joe, I'm looking for Jesus. I'm not worried about what Joe didn't give me. How many know that there's some people that owe you money right here, right now? But you know what? Let that go. <laughs> they may never pay you. They're going to talk about they're going to pay you, but they may never pay you. But the reality is how many know God has paid you many, many, many times over since the time of that incident? And God is the type of God that when you're faithful in your giving, he'll turn around and give back to you faithful as well. Is there anyone in the building that can testify that God is faithful in giving back to you? Well, Pastor John, how do you know? He gave me my health. He gave me my life. He gave me some Daniel Fast Friendly food. He put a raiment on my back. He gave me gas in my car. He gave me a job to go to. He gave me a promotion on the job. My children are well. Things are going good. How many know I'd rather have that than to worry about anything else? Because God is a good giver. Oh, yes, he is. And so Jesus is saying in chapter 6 that I need you to understand that it's all about how you treat other people. That's what it means to be a faithful disciple. Because earlier in Luke's gospel, chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, it is there that there's an incident where Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And as he's in the synagogue, a man comes in with a shriveled hand. And it's there that Jesus, seeing the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in the midst, he's saying, I know what they're thinking, but I need them to understand that this thing is about how we treat others. Earlier in the text, Jesus lets them know that, that man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. And so he wants them to understand that these days that have been set aside and are, quote, unquote, the law, he says, how much more should we help somebody and bless somebody who is in need of something? He shows this man with the shriveled hand. And as Jesus is teaching, he asks them to stand in the midst. And it is there that Jesus pronounces healing upon this man. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law became angry and indignant because they did not know what to do with Jesus. But Jesus was showing the example that we have to be considerate of other people as a part of the design for discipleship. Jesus knew what they were thinking. But Jesus heals the man. He heals the man's right hand. And his hand is fully restored. He says, now, beloved, don't judge, don't condemn, learn to forgive, and learn to give. And in return, when, what, when you give, what you give will be given back to you many, many times over. But there, the Pharisees and teachers of the law didn't understand what Jesus was saying. In fact, beloved, they were saying how? Jesus said in Luke 6, verses 46 and 47, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? 
It's right there in text. It says, why you don't do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my word and puts them into practice, he says, I will show you what they are like. And verse 48 says that they're like a man who built his house on a solid foundation. A man who built his house on the rock. And then he said, that man, though the floods may come in and the winds may blow and strike the house, the house will not be shaken. Why? Because it's well built. It's built on a solid foundation. But verse 49 of Luke 6 says this, but the people who hear the word and do not put the word into practice is like the man who built a house on the sand without a foundation. And the moment the storm strikes and the moment things become topsy-turvy, the house will collapse. Why? And it is destroyed. Why? Because there's no solid foundation underneath the house. Jesus was teaching them what it means to be a faithful disciple. Now Jesus shows them in Luke's gospel chapter 7 what it means to act like a faithful disciple. Because it's one thing to know what it means to be a disciple, but it's something else to be act as a faithful disciple. So we look at Luke's gospel, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Keep your Bibles open so you can see I'm not making anything up. Jesus has just, amen, finished talking to the disciples as he comes into Capernaum, his headquarters. And watch it, the centurion sends uh, someone to tell Jesus that uh, a centurion servant who was near and dear to him was sick and ready to die. Now a centurion is a Roman soldier who commands upwards of a hundred military soldiers. Century, centurion, a hundred soldiers. This man had the command of a hundred soldiers. And so he probably was a Gentile, a Roman. More than likely, he was despised by the Jews due to the fact that he was connected to the Roman Empire. And normally, this would mean that the commander, the centurion, would be ones who would abuse their power. They would have overreach on their power. But this man was different. The Bible says, verse 2, we get a glimpse of the heart of this man for the servant that he highly valued and honored though he was dying. Such compassion was unheard of by a Roman soldier. And the unexpected interruption in this part of the text is that this man cared and had compassion because care and compassion will sometimes come through unlikely sources. How many can testify to that? that someone will care for you and have compassion on you and you don't even really know them. That somebody right now is praying for you that you don't even know because they have care and compassion for the people of God. And that's why we should never dismiss people and never dismiss folks that seem unlikely to be connected to God because the reality is God can use anyone that he wants to, when he wants to, and how he wants to. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. Write this down, that it details the same story about this centurion. It's slightly different in the detail because it talks about the fact that the centurion actually met Jesus. In Luke's Gospel, it talks about the centurion sending people. Now, the reality is when someone comes as an emissary, that they then are a representation of that individual. So whether the man was actually there or whether he sent people, it doesn't really matter. We know he was represented there. And so the servant's sickness is detailed in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 6, where it says that the servant's sickness was at the point of paralysis and pain, which means he can't move, he's filled with misery, and pain is all around him. Yet the centurion, seeing his servant, has compassion on him. And when he heard that Jesus was in town, he then wants him to come and heal this highly valued, highly honored individual who in the eyes of others seems as insignificant as small. He is a low-level servant. But the centurion learned to look in the face of the other and learn to find value. 
In fact, I want y'all to do an exercise with me real quick, and I'm going to keep the sermon moving. I want you to look at the person behind you. Don't break your neck, though. But look at the person behind you. And if you if you're the last row, look at the person in front of you. And, and when you look at them, look at them and smile. Yeah, yeah, smile. I know you got your mask on, but still smile. Amen. Show all 32 underneath the mask. Amen. And tell them God sees value in you. There is value in all of God's children. That's why we should never dismiss anyone from the youngest to the eldest, from those that have high social economic status to low economic status. You, you don't dismiss anybody, amen, because how many know that God can use anybody to bring forth a blessing? Oh, it's in 2 Kings chapter 5. I wish I had time to preach. It's 2 Kings chapter 5 where Naaman heard the word of a servant girl that was with him. And it was the servant girl that said, if my master would only go see the prophet, if only go see the prophet, the prophet would tell him what to do and he would be healed of his leprosy and at the word of a servant girl. Naaman goes to see Elijah and he then begins to go and dip seven times in the river. Now, Naaman wanted him to come out and wave his hand over the spot. He said, but, but Elisha said, no, I ain't coming out. I'm just going to give you a word. Go dip seven times in, in the water and you're going to be healed. He said, are there not greater rivers in Damascus than this dirty river Jordan? But yet and still, while he's hemming and hawing, the word is still, if you would just go and take a dip down in the Jordan, your body would be made whole. He goes and he dips seven times. Y'all know the story. And his body becomes reformed. But had he not heard the word of the little servant girl, he would not have experienced the transformation that God has in his life. Never dismiss somebody who seems to be low in, in comparison to you. Because the reality is all of us are nothing more than piles of dust in the eyes of God. Tell a neighbor, you ain't nothing but dust. You ain't nothing but dust in the eyes of God. I know you got a high-ranking position, and you ain't nothing but dust. I know you got a little money in the bank. You ain't nothing but dust. I know you got two or three cars in the garage. You ain't nothing but dust. I, I know you got some steaks that's frozen, amen, because we on the fast. that y'all ready to thaw out, amen, on Easter, but you ain't nothing but dust. And once we recognize that we're nothing but dust under the sign and under the guides of God, then we can then re realize and recognize that we're all the same in God's sight. There's value in everyone. I got to move. Text says that as they're on their way to the house, a delegation of Jews come with Jesus and they say, Jesus, you need to hear this man's concerns. You need to come, verses 4 and 5, because we come on behalf. And they pleaded with Jesus, watch it, that this man deserves for you to do this because he loves our nation. And this man has built our synagogue for us. So verse 6 says, so Jesus went with them. Here, here's another unexpected interruption. The spokesperson on behalf of those individuals, on, on behalf of the centurion, were individuals who were a collection of Jewish elders. But they only wanted Jesus to go because of the transaction that had taken place between the centurion and these Jewish leaders. See, beloved, they only were concerned about the fact that this centurion deserves this because he loves our nation and he built our synagogue for us. The Jewish elders became the mouthpiece for the centurion because of the money gift that was given by the centurion. But the reality is, beloved, listen, never approach God with a sense of entitlement. Because the reality is none of us deserve anything from God at all. Listen, listen, we don't deserve a thing from God. We don't deserve his grace and mercy. Yet this morning, he woke us up and touched us with his finger of love. And grace and mercy yet abounded in our lives. 
You and I don't deserve anything, but everything we get is given to us out of God's generosity toward us. And even though, beloved, you make good money, I said it this morning, don't let money make you. I'm going to say it again. You may make good money, but don't let money make you. You see, Job understood this full well. Job understood this, that the, the Lord's name is blessed. And Job, Bible says in Job chapter 1, he tore his robe, shaved his head, but he fell on the ground and worshiped God and said, naked came I from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. He worshiped God. In chapter 2, his wife was getting on his nerves and she was saying, why don't you just curse God and die? Job had lost everything, all of his possessions, all of his houses, all of his children, all of his livestock. She said, God is punishing you. You still being faithful to God after all this that has taken place? And he said, you talk like a foolish woman. You talking crazy woman. You need to understand that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Shall we not take the good, take the good and not the bad? In other words, beloved, whatever God allows in our lives, God is still worthy to be praised. Whatever takes place in our lives, no matter good or bad, you better get on your knees and worship Almighty God because we don't deserve anything in the first place. But God loves us enough to keep blessing us despite ourselves. Anybody thankful for that? The elders were taking uh, this man taking Jesus to this centurion because they were only thinking transactionally but the centurion was looking for transformation because the Bible shows us another unexpected interruption where friends come to meet Jesus the Bible says they're close to the house Jesus is coming to the house with the elders when the centurion sends another group of friends to tell Jesus Lord verse 6 don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Watch this. They said he deserves this, but watch this. The centurion turns around and says, I don't deserve you even coming underneath my roof. In other words, the centurion understood that it's not about transaction, but it's about transformation. It's about the fact that I serve a God that's bigger than me. A God that can do more than I can even fathom. Verse 7 says, that's why I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, God help me, and my servant will be healed. Look at his humility in the face of what should be hostility. The Jews and the Gentiles do not get along, but at the same time, this Gentile recognized the authority that Jesus has. See, if you want to demonstrate great faith and you want to have a genuine encounter with God, you got to recognize God's authority. You got to humble yourself before God. Look at how much he cared not only for his servant, but how much he respected Jesus. Great faith is not just about putting others above yourself. Great faith is also about having a genuine concern about God coming into your life. Is anybody concerned about Jesus living in your life, being in your life? Anybody concerned about the fact that Jesus Christ wants to sup with you? I never forget, beloved, one time, and all of us, you see, I'm going I'm to miss something personal, amen. I'm being transparent. Y'all give me 10 minutes and I'm out of here. Uh, being transparent, that all of us have what I call a junk room, junk room. You, you, if you say you don't, you lying, amen. You, it's bad to lie on communion Sunday, amen. All of us got a junk room. That's a room where we throw everything to prepare for company coming because we ain't got no other place to put stuff. Come on now, y'all, let's see, see. You put it in the cupboards. You put stuff in the garage. You put stuff in the basement, in the back. You put stuff out of the way so that nobody when they come over can see your junk. But guess what? Jesus said, leave your junk where it is. He says, I'm coming to sup with you. I'm coming to live with you. It does not matter what your house looks like. I come just to be with you. And somebody ought to praise God for that, that you ain't got to move nothing. 
You ain't got to take nothing out of the way. The Lord will accept you right where you are and Jesus will even help you clean up the junk in your house. Oh, I'm a witness that he will. Whatever junk is in your life, Jesus will help to clean it up in the midst. The Bible shows us that he has a, a, a concern for Jesus coming into his life. And the centurion is being courteous to Jesus because he recognizes that courtesy counts. He recognizes that Jesus is, is not worthy to come into his house because as a Gentile, the Jews felt that they would be defiled into walking into a house of a Gentile. But great faith not only is courteous, great faith not only cares about what Jesus is concerned about and not only concerned about others, but great faith shows confidence in the words of Jesus. The Bible says, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Now in the Greek, this is a bold command that he gives to Jesus. He speaks the word my, and speak the word Jesus and my servant will be healed. This soldier was used to making commands. The centurion was used to sharing and commands and telling people what to do. But in an unexpected interruption, making commands only when they're grounded in great confidence in Jesus Christ will achieve great results for you and I. In other words, beloved, this confidence springs from the fact that what he comprehends about Jesus and what he commands in the nature of Jesus is based upon the fact that he recognizes the power behind Jesus. See, great faith shows that there's the courtesy that is extended to Jesus. Great faith shows that there then is confidence in Jesus. And great faith comprehends the power that is in within Jesus. And understand this, verse 8 shares with us that he says, I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one what to do and they do it. I tell this one to go and they go. I tell this one to come and they come. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. He understood the command structure. So he turns around and says, I'm under authority, but I'm also a person of authority. But you see, even if you have authority, you've got to submit your authority under Jesus Christ. Take authority and submit unto Jesus and then stand on authority and understand that that authority has power to do some transformative things, which gives us to the final unexpected interruption. For the Bible says that Jesus heard these things, watch the text, and he marveled text says he was amazed at these, this man's words. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in all of Israel. Here it is. The centurion's faith shocks Jesus. Why, Pastor Jones, does this centurion's faith shock Jesus? Because the level of faith was not seen in any other disciple, but the man who was a Gentile displays a level of faith in God, although he's not walking with God. See, a man like this centurion who was not a disciple, but yet demonstrated great faith is showing current disciples what it means to have great faith. And this same kind of amazement that we see in Luke 7 is also the same kind of amazement that Jesus had in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. And this was due to the lack of faith that was in Nazareth. But the Bible says that Jesus had just finished reading from the scroll of Isaiah, and he closed up the book and said, Today, what you have heard is being fulfilled in your hearing. And upon hearing this, the people marveled at the fact that he said this, and they were amazed. They said, isn't this Joseph's son? But Jesus goes on to say that there was a widow woman in Zarephath that received the miracle of the prophet. Now, anybody else could have received the miracle, but only the woman in Zarephath received the miracle because she was open in faith to receive it. He says then that the man Naaman was also one 
who received the miracle of God during that time where the prophet was able to speak over Naaman. But he said all of the people in Israel could have received that same type of blessing, but it was only the foreigner that received that type of blessing. He said the same thing it is with you with your lack of faith. And so with this same amazement in the lack of faith, Jesus shows the same amazement in the great faith of the centurion. You see, the centurion had great faith. Great faith is being fully convinced of the possibility of difficult promises and hard truths coming to pass. I'm going to say it again. The centurion had great faith because his great faith was fully convinced of the possibility of different and difficult promises and hard truths coming to pass in people's lives. See, you've got to move from belief to trust even when what you're trusting God for seems like an impossibility. Even when you're looking in the face some things that seem insurmountable and hard to overcome, when you have faith in God, God is showing us that when you stand on your faith and believe that God is able, that God says, I'll do whatever it is that I have the power to do. See, the amazing thing in Luke's text is that the centurion never met Jesus face to face, but he still had a genuine encounter with the Lord. He believed that Jesus could heal from a distance. He believed, Lord, if you just say the word, at your word, things will change in my life. And beloved, great faith believes that words matter. Great faith is not some higher level of conversion or convic convic conversion or conviction, but great faith means that I'm not going to waver on believing in what the word of God says. This man wasn't even baptized. We didn't read about him getting baptized, but yet and still the Bible says he has great faith. Beloved, this is what I want to leave you with. He believed in something hard. And in return, the Lord healed his servant. I'm going to say it again. He believed in something hard, challenging, and difficult. And he did not waver in his faith. And the Lord brought it to pass. And see, he didn't dictate to God how to heal. He just said, Lord, any way you want to do it, go ahead and heal. And sometimes, beloved, we block our own blessings because we put stipulations on Jesus on how things ought to be done in our lives. Lord, not only do I want you to bless me, but I want you to bless me this way. Lord, not only do I want you to bless me, but I'm not open to any other way of you doing it except the way I said do it. But this centurion said, Lord, if you just speak the word, I know any which way my servant would be healed. And because of his faith, it stopped Jesus in his tracks. He was shocked at the centurion. And he says to the centurion and about this man, verse 10, that, 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 that those who are returning to the house, once they return to the house, they found the servant well. Listen, in the Greek, it means that he was fully healthy. Not only was his paralysis gone, not only was his pain gone, but the disease that caused the paralysis and pain was removed from the man. And this is an example that Jesus uses in order to instruct the disciples on what it means to have great faith. Because great faith leads to great promises. And great promises achieves great results. So I want to declare and decree to you today before I wrap this sermon up that God is interested in dealing with the hard things of your life. I know there's some things that may be deep-seated and deep-rooted, some things that may be difficult and challenging that you must face. But the Lord told me to tell you, whatever the hard things are, trust God that he can make it happen. He can turn it around. He can bring you out of it. He can bring you through. Is there anybody trusting God for unexpected interruptions? Oh, that means you got to be open to the move of God. You got to be open for God doing what God says he's able to do. This centurion trusted God to the hilt. He trusted the Lord in all that he did. And it was counted to him in two gospels that this man had faith. And all what great faith will accomplish. Because when you have great faith in God, God can take care of the hard things. I don't know what hard things you're dealing with. 
I don't know what stuff is in front of you that seems insurmountable. But if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I guarantee you something will happen. Don't y'all know how to push? Pray until something happens. Something's going to happen because you're expecting unexpected interruption. I said it this morning, I'm closing with this, that my brother was at Brown University. He was in his room trying to deal with some dilemmas that was going on in his life. And then it was all of a sudden he said, Lord, he started praying, Lord, I feel alone in this situation. I don't know how to deal or handle this situation, but Lord, I need a sign to let me know that you're right here with me, Lord. And sometimes Lord will speak through his word. Sometimes the Lord will speak through other people. Sometimes the Lord will speak to your mind. And then sometimes the Lord will speak through a radio. My brother said as he finished praying, the song popped up on his radio by Michael Jackson that you are not alone. I am here with you. The song popped up out of nowhere. And the thing that got my brother was that the radio wasn't even plugged in. You see, when God is trying to get a message to you, no matter what way possible, he'll find a way to speak to your life. And is there anybody out there that can testify that the Lord is looking to speak some things into your life? No matter what you're dealing with, when you're on God's side, he'll be right there for you. He'll be there with you and help you to get through your troubled times. But you got to trust God when you can't trace him. you got to believe that God is able to deal with whatever is happening in your life. But you got to understand that God is there with you. Is there anybody out there today? I'm closing. That God knows that God will be there for you in times of trouble. That God will be there for you in times of storm. That God will be there to help you every step of the way. But you gotta trust him and keep walking on the water. You gotta trust him and keep believing and trusting. You gotta trust him and know that every Thing will work out fine but even when things are difficult you just got to hold on to God's unchanging hand and God will see you through do I have a witness out there he will yes he will yes he will see you through But when the storms are raging, you got to trust in God. Hold to his hand and make sure your soul is gripped to the solid rock. This is in honor of my father's birthday. Though the storms keep on raging in my life. And sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day. Still that hope that lies within, it reassures. As I keep my eyes upon the distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. Oh, but the storms don't cease, and if the wind I'm low in my life my soul has been hallelujah in the Lord oh, you see That sometimes in this life, yes, sir, you're gonna be tossed. 
by the waves and the currents, yes, that seem so fierce. But this is what I love about it, y'all. In the Word of God, oh, I've got an anchor, hallelujah, and it keeps me steadfast and unmovable despite the time oh but if the storms don't cease and if the winds keep on blowing in my life oh my soul has been Yes, Lord. My soul has been anchored. Listen, you crush me down, but Jesus picks me up. And then he sticks by me when the going gets tough. My soul, my soul, yes, sir. My soul, my soul. may roll and break us, may dash. But I shall not sway because he holds me fast. So dark the day, clouds in the sky. I know it's all right, cause Jesus is not. My soul been anchored, yeah. My soul been anchored. My soul has been anchored. My soul. Somebody give God the glory, give God the praise. He's worthy. Yes, yes he is. Yes he is. Yes he is. My soul, my soul, my soul, my soul. My soul, my soul, my soul, my soul, my Hallelujah.